We recording? There we go. Hey everyone, it's your boy Terry. I'm talking in hushed tones because it's about eh, almost 11 o'clock on Saturday. Um, no one's really sleeping, but the house is kind of quiet, so I'm not looking to rouse anyone up. Here's my post gig voice. Sang a bunch last night at karaoke. Had a fun night at karaoke. Uh, I'm trying not to look like a nervous parent because my 16 year old son is out with friends just driving around. And he's a good boy, but he's got an hour to get home, then um, phones are going to start ringing. Uh, but he's a pretty good kid, and he surrounds himself with pretty good kid friends. So uh, I won't be nervous until an hour from now, which I might just make an hour-long video just to keep myself busy until then. As you can see, I did a little trimming. Uh, I didn't shave. Uh, I just took the clippers to the beard, and the uh, everything was getting a little thick for me. And when I met this... Um, Extended volume, you might say. Uh, the thicker my beard gets, the rounder my already round face looks. So it just gets more oblong with the beard. And I'm oblong enough. Uh, but I kept just enough stubble to keep the ladies happy. Ladies, stubble. Anyway, coming to you live from the Terry Cave. Yes, the blankets are still hanging on the windows. Uh, no cats in here as of yet. Shouldn't be a long video. I know I say that all the time. Uh, but then 20 minutes later, I still haven't said anything. Anyway, I'll get right into it. Um, cars. Ah, my cars. I have two cars. I have a 2002 Ford Focus, um, given to me by my late great mother, Marlene O'Brien. Didn't really want it, uh, but as she was entering the final phases of her illness, she said, Terry, please take my car. And when your dying mother says, son, please take my car while you, you take your dying mother's car. Um, and it's proven to be a, a stalwart little vehicle there. Some things here and there, the heat doesn't work, which is fine in the summer, not so much in the winter. Uh, and wanted to get that fixed, but that's like a thousand dollar repair that I'm just not quite paid for right now. Uh, anyway, the, then we have a 2007, uh, Dodge Caravan minivan. Love that car. Never gives us trouble until it did. I'm guessing sometime during that last snowstorm, we hit a drift or ice or something, and then we have a, a leak in the uh, coolant system. I'm already making a short story long. Took that in to get the coolant fixed. Uh, and then we had a friend who was helping us uh, with those repairs. I'm not quite uh, financially able to absorb those kind of blows in the winter. Um, so took that car in to get fixed. And we had a friend say he was going to help us out with it, uh, with the bills. Uh, so... We were instructed to take the second car in because the the white car, the Focus, needed um, some work done to it as well. That that car has like a running checklist of items that need fixed on it. And my mechanic, Chuck at Sunset, he's the best. He just kind of keeps a running tab of fixes on that car. So anyway, I'm making a really short story really long. Uh, here's the long and short of it. Took the blue car, that's the van, to get the coolant leak fixed. Picked that up, paid for it, brought it home. Brought the white car in. Actually drove the white car in to pick the blue car up. Now the white car is getting work on it. A couple days later, we take the blue car in. Because uh, I'm not quite able to pay to get the white cart out of the car out of the uh, garage yet. But all my karaoke gear is in there. So I transfer the karaoke gear from the white car to the blue car. And while I'm doing that, after I finish that, I notice a bunch of green liquid under the blue car. So I call my mechanic. I was like, hey, Chuck, take a look at this. He's like, well, yeah, I guess we missed something. Um... Put your stuff back in the white car. Take your white car home with the blue one here. So, okay, I'll go ahead and move that stuff back in the car. I just took that up. But first, I got to pick up my sons at school from rehearsal. I'll take them home. Then I'll come back and get that stuff. Uh, so it was blue car in, drop off the white car, pick up the blue car, take the blue car to get stuff out of the white car. And then it's the blue car needs a fix. Carry the stuff back in the white car, take the white car out. Blue car still sitting there. Um... And uh, the person very graciously uh, helped us with paying for one set of bills. The other set of bills uh, we're not quite prepared to pay for just now, which is fine because the other car's back in the shop anyway. It's going to put it on my tab. I'll have it paid off about the time I can pay off a new car. Uh, but I'm not here to bitch about uh, being broke because I've been broke for 25 years. Uh, just one of those, this is uh, one of those into every rain, a little life must fall kind of deals. And Chuck even said, well, Terry, you must be strong because they say God never gives you more than you can handle. And you're handling this pretty well. I was like, Chuck, thank you. But I would I would take one thing. One thing this winter that I could handle would be 
quite all right. I find the blue behind me sort of soothing. Maybe that's why I'm not freaking out quite as much. I'm in a very calmly toned room here. Uh, but all you can do is laugh, you know. Um, which we did heartily last night at karaoke. Uh, really another nice, solid night. Um, the DeLong uh, family was out celebrating a birthday. Aaron DeLong, whom I met 12 years ago doing karaoke, uh, is married to Joe. They both have a birthday on March 9th, which was last night. Yes, today's the 10th. Just checking the date on my computer. And they were out singing some songs and having some fun there. Uh, beautiful and talented and lovely and uh, very kind to daughter. Miranda worked for me at Elaine's this past year. She was in the show. So she was a server. She's just great. But I got a look from the mom last night that was the look I got from Miranda a thousand times this summer. That one of those, the thousand yard stare. Like, What do you want me to do? Uh, but they were great. And um, they are a really talented, wonderful family. She's a nurse. I'm not sure what the dad does. Uh, but the youngest son, Joey, is best friends with my youngest son, 12, Henry. In fact, I guess I'm just using names here. Um, it's like, hey, we should do this more often. You guys can, we sat down and had a drink afterwards, just, you know, shooting the, shooting the beans. And um, yeah, that's it. It was just fun at a karaoke. The Long family, great. Um, I'm going to try to close this with a book review. So I want to get through the topics here. Um, oh, I discovered a new podcast. It's on the Earwolf Podcast Network. That's where the fabulous How Did This Get Made podcast is posted. Uh, about every two weeks, they put a new chapter up. You get the main chapter of How Did This Get Made, which is about the movie itself. I think I mentioned the last one was about Ladybugs, the Rodney Dangerfield movie, where Rodney Dangerfield is the coach of a young girl's soccer team but brings his girlfriend's son in and who pretends to be a girl and it's just really really strange like anytime Rodney Dangerfield is in a scene with one of these kids it's just really uncomfortable and the whole movie is just a cringe a cringe fest um anyway on the Earwolf Network I discovered it's a podcast by Scott Ackerman uh, who's on a show called Comedy Bang Bang I have to admit I don't really know him that much uh, but it's also hosted by Adam Scott, who you'd recognize if you saw him. He was on Parks and Recreation. He was Leslie Nope's um, boyfriend, then husband. Uh, he's just sort of very dry, sardonic wit to him. He's been in a million movies. Uh, Leslie Nope was played by the blonde from Saturday Night Live that's not Tina Fey, Amy Poehler. Uh, her husband's name was Adam Scott. So Adam Scott and Scott Aukerman host this podcast. Uh, they did a series called Are You Talking You Too to Me? That's right. Are you talking U2 to me, meaning the band U2, that an album by album breakdown of every U2 album that plays a snippet of a song, talk about each song. Um, I'm not the hugest U2 fan, so that didn't hold much interest to me. Uh, but then I heard they were doing another new podcast. It's called Are You Talking R.E.M. Re Me? Are You Talking R.E.M. Re colon Me? And it's the same deal. Uh, they're doing an album by album. Cat! She looks hungry. It's an album by album, song by song, breakdown of every uh, R.E.M. album. And once again, if you've talked to me for more than five minutes, you know what a very large R.E.M. fan I am uh, from uh, my days in college. Uh, I went to college a little older than most because I had a short stint in the military first, which we covered before. So I got to college right around age 19, 20. Uh, but it was right in that sweet spot of alternative music, uh, which rose up in sort of the mid 80s until about the mid 90s. And the alternative thing sort of got co-opted into top 40 and kind of died. Uh, it was a pretty good decade stretch there. R.E.M. was like the the uh, the Beatles of, of that movement, if I had to make an analogy, which I'm not sure how apt an analogy that is. But they were the biggest thing in that um, movement with the Cure, the Smiths, the Smithereens. Uh, a lot of great bands came out of that era. And so it's just great. Um, those guys are very, very funny. They sound so much alike, I'm never sure which one is talking. Uh, but if you are a fan of R.E.M., as I am, they're on my Mount Rushmore. Prince, Billy Joel, R.E.M., Squeeze, Beatles. Uh, I know it's five. There's only four on Mount Rushmore, but a little artistic license, please. Uh, so, yeah, it's a lot. Of, they're very funny. They go off into all kinds of different segues and different. So it, uh, it's, a two, it's about a 90-minute to two-hour podcast. Um, they just go off on so many tangents. If they just talked REM, it'd be 30 to 45 minutes, but the rest of it is just, they go off on little uh, tangents. It's great. 
uh, and uh, the sort of style of podcast I'm looking to launch on my own in the very near future with my man uh, Kevin Ebner. Uh, and so in that vein, my song recommendation of the week, is, it's a tough choice, but I'm going to go with a very accessible REM song, uh, an accessible early REM song. Some of their stuff can get a little dense and opaque. Uh, the singer of REM, Michael Stipe, famous uh, for not really singing lyrics and just kind of making noises that sound like words. Um, sometimes I call him mumbles. And in the early days before the internet, when I was in my band Southwind, we would pick up the occasional REM song to sing before the internet and before um, digital music. I'd sit and listen, go out and buy the REM tape and listen to the song over and over and over and over to get one lyric at a time. Especially the song I'm sure you know by REM called It's the End of the World as We Know It, which is kind of stream of consciousness rant by Michael Stipe. And getting those lyrics written down in the pre-internet age was uh, something of a task. Um, so I charted them all out, and about 10 years later, I got a computer, and the first thing I did was check my REM lyrics against the actual lyrics for the song, End of the World as We Know It. And I got about 30% of them right, which was, I thought, pretty good. Uh, anyway, the song I'm recommending is called Don't Go Back to Rockville. Uh, it's sort of a country-flavored uh, pop song from about 1984. 485, the album, oh gosh, Reckoning. The album is called Reckoning. Uh, there are several REM songs of that era. I could also equally recommend it's just great early REM songs, Fall On Me, um, Talk About the Passion, really any of that early stuff. Um, if you just give it some time, wait for the chorus, uh, Harbor Coat, um, Lower Wolves. Uh, God, so many great songs off of there in that early REM era. But for one to start you out with, let's go with Don't Go Back to Rockville by REM. Uh, I'm also deeply into season two of Jessica Jones on Netflix. If you are unaware, uh, Jessica, Jessica, sorry, me talk good. And 12 minutes in, haven't talked about anything. Jessica Jones is part of the Marvel television cinematic universe. Uh, you had the big movies with Thor, Captain America, Spider-Man, and Iron Man. This is kind of a lower, they call these guys street-level heroes uh, that don't do all the big giant... Cat! That cat is going crazy. She's run in and out of the room four times. I don't know if you can hear her running around back there. She's going nuts. And now she's ripping up my new mattress. Anyway, uh, Jessica Jones, uh, Daredevil, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and Punisher. Those are the five uh, sort of street-level sort of lower-powered superheroes, but still part of that same expanded universe. They just don't appear in the movies. They're on the TV. Where'd she go? She's going to knock that door back open again in a minute. That's Xena, by the way. Xena and Misty. Uh, and it's season two of Jessica Jones, and it's really good. Um, it's kind of about... It's 13 episodes, and I don't want to give away too much, but it's sort of about dealing with uh, physical and psychological trauma on a sort of superhero level. Uh, I'm not quite finished. i got about three episodes to go. Um, and I'm really enjoying it. I think Jessica Jones is my favorite of the television properties. Uh, some of them are really good. Some of them not quite as good. I loved uh, the first season of Daredevil. I loved, loved Jessica Jones season one. was probably my favorite Marvel property of all of them at that time, including the movies and the television shows. Uh, and they all came together in a series called The Defenders. Uh, last year, where all four of them were caught up in a plot line that led them to a central showdown with a villain. And that was pretty good. That was only, I think, eight episodes. They should all be about eight episodes. Eight to ten hours, I think, is good for those shows. Um, but if you don't want to get invested in what's now like a 17 or 18 movie deep movie universe, the shows are all right there on Netflix, and it's a relatively short uh, time commitment. And for the most part, they're really good. Uh, okay, weight loss challenge. I'm down two pounds from where I started, and this just last week or so, in earnest, have been making um, efforts to uh, eliminate some things from my diet, do a little bit of extra physical activity when the weather warrants it, walking here instead of driving there, um, that kind of thing. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's a process. This time of year is going to sort of stay on the, uh, hopefully keep it on an even keel, not keep going up, but kind of stay around this level. And I want to get busier for summer. I should start dropping right down. Uh, but I did want to talk about, ta-da, I finished Crimson Tide. I kind of get it, there we go. 
I finished, I almost called it Crimson Tide, which is a great uh, Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman submarine movie, but this is Crimson Shore, the Preston and Child uh, novel. Finished it oh, about 45 minutes ago. I did a live stream the other night, so I'm trying not to cover up the speaker. Uh, it was, this was a fine book. It's not the worst book I ever read. Uh, again, it suffered in uh, comparison to the Crace books, which is just such a different dynamic style. And I think I figured out what it is that the um, the Crace books just go. You're dropped into sort of um, a central, not even so much a mystery. There's just a, a plot line. Someone goes missing. Um, someone is abducted. Someone is murdered. And you sort of pick up and you go. And those Crace books just go, 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 go. And these um, precedent and child books are more of a classic mystery where you, their characters are introduced and there's clues and who who done it and it's this guy tries very hard to be sort of a, a Sherlock Holmes type character, uh, which is for me coming off the uh, run of Crace books just didn't quite uh, never quite made that transition back into this style of writing. It's not a bad book. It felt very much like a thriller, a filler episode like when you're watching a, a tv show and you have a running plot line and you're waiting to get to the climax but it's episode 12 out of 22 you're not you know they're not going to resolve the mystery halfway through the season so they put filler episodes in there just to get you to the end of the season and this felt like a filler book because the previous three books before this were part of a, a trilogy of stories about this agent pendergast and the woman who was his wife and now they're uh, this felt like a setup to the next thing, uh, which I felt all along, and turns out that's what it was, because the last few pages of this book, it very much appears that Agent Pendergast has passed away, except that, dun, 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 if you can see that, it says, The Obsidian Chamber, a Pendergast novel. So it's not much of a spoiler to say, I, I've read the first 10 pages of Obsidian Chamber, uh, but I'm pretty sure I haven't seen Agent Pendergast back yet, but I'm pretty sure a Pendergast novel uh, would not be called a Pendergast novel if Pendergast had actually died in Crimson Shore. That's probably the fourth or fifth book that at the very end, it seems like Pendergast has passed away. Uh, just the main mystery of this book wasn't super compelling. And then it got into like witchcraft and Wiccan and all this stuff that I'm just not all that interested in. And now... Uh, Obsidian Chamber. This ends uh, with very a very dun dun dun. Tune in next week, cliffhanger that gets picked up in Obsidian Chamber. Am I making anyone nauseous yet? Uh, with the character we thought was dead and has ties to the family, and it's kind of like uh, okay. And Crimson Shore is the fifteenth. Uh, Pendergast novel. This is going to be the 16th Pendergast novel, and it just kind of feels like maybe um, if you're going to go back and revisit and resuscitate and read... Oh my gosh, look! Now they're both in here. I think they're stalking me. And as soon as I close my eyes, they're going to strike and pounce. Is my shirt on backwards? No. Okay. Anyway, um, I'm going to read Obsidian Chamber and kind of see where it goes. But this whole family thing was kind of dealt with in the previous three novels. I'm just kind of, okay. I mean, I'll read out of loyalty, but I'm not super grabbed uh, by this one yet. Again, I've only read the first two chapters, so we'll we'll see where it goes. But I'm, I'm willing to give, I'll give these upstart new writers a chance on their 16th Pendergast novel uh, and among the other 20 novels they've written between them. Uh, it's just, I think I'm really just struggling coming out of Crace and going into Preston Child. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're into these novels, um, worth the read. I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry I read it. It took five days to read it. Um, and um, I guess it's not a glowing recommendation, but if you're into the Agent Pendergast series and you haven't just read 12 Robert Crace novels, then it's probably perfectly enjoyable and I'm being hypercritical of it. And um, I think that's all I got for tonight. And look, we talked about nothing, and it's 20 minutes later. Um, anything else? I told you my birthday story, right? Um, we'll talk. I'm still going to do that Robert Crace sort of book by book thing, but I need. I just finished the Downton Stabby script. I'm working on a new spec script. That means just a script I'm writing of my own volition, not based uh, an original script. Uh, once I get the notes of that down, I'm going to start doing that Robert Crace breakdown for you. Anyway, uh, hit subscribe, uh, hit the bell, make sure you get notifications. 
Uh, sorry for the lateness of this post, but it was kind of a busy day. Um, the tree is still standing, that nor'easter. I know a lot of people got dumped on north of us, but that second storm that was supposed to hit us on Wednesday, we got very little aside from that snowstorm I showed you outside. But there's supposed to be another one coming up right after the weekend, so we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, that's it. Uh, please recommend this to your friends. My friend Amy Jan Francisco is a new subscriber. I'm not sure she's going to watch the videos, but if she is, Amy, thanks for writing me last night. Great to hear from you, as ever. Um, that's going to do it. Again, another 20 minutes where I talked about nothing. Uh, Till next time, be good.